Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Booth Western Art Museum. I'm Seth Hopkins, the director. For anybody I haven't met, welcome, welcome. I know we have many first timers here tonight, and uh, we appreciate you coming out and being part of this really wonderful cultural event. Before we get started, I just want to let you know a couple of things going on here. Actually, this weekend at the museum, it's one of our biggest weekends of the year. On Saturday, we will kick off the 16th annual Cowboy Chuck Wagon Gathering. And we will have Jesse and Woody from Toy Story. Everybody seen Toy Story? How, ha hi, howdy, hey, hi. Jesse and uh, Woody will be here taking pictures with kids, so bring the kids or the grandkids out and enjoy that. Uh, also, our good friend Jim Roden from Marietta, Georgia, who's just written a kid's book called The Adventures of Cowboy Little and Cowboy Small. And it's based on stories he's been telling to two generations of kids and grandkids in his family. And it's really a cool book, and he's going to be reading from that. We also have the legendary chuck wagon cook and steakhouse owner Tom Perini will be here. Uh, between him and his partner, who basically invented the Texas chuck wagon catering business, they've cooked for seven presidents. And uh, he was actually set up on the grounds of the White House to cook steaks for 1,600 people on 9-10. And 9-11, he didn't get to cook. But uh, he will tell that story and many others when he's here talking about the history of the chuck wagon, how he got into the catering business, and eventually how he got into sending smoked beef tenderloins out as corporate gifts at $125 a piece. They ship 27,000 of those a year. So that's a, 30, that's a $3 million business all by itself. So he'll tell you about how that happened, which was a happy accident. So we, need, we all need accidents like that in our, in our lives, I think. We also have a uh, songwriter workshop going on Saturday. Tony Arata, who wrote The Dance for Garth Brooks, probably one of the greatest country songs ever written. He will be here teaching a workshop Saturday morning. So if you ever want to write a country song, here's your chance to come and learn from one of the best. And then uh, that evening, we have a big show at the Grand Theater. Uh, Tony will be opening for Kristen Harris, who is the three-time winner of the Entertainer of the Year Award with the Western Music Association. She's a pint-sized powerhouse of Western music which is different from country music, and uh, it's going to be a really great show at the booth. You can get tickets to uh, also the Chuck Wagon Lunch online or that concert or uh, see somebody at the front desk on the way out tonight. We also have some cool exhibitions around the museum, including Treasures from the Vault, retrospectives of T. Allen Lawson and Bob Kohlbrenner, and different ecologies, landscapes by John Cleveland. Uh, tonight we're joined by our friends from Canada. Let's hear it for Canada. And here representing the Canadian consulate, I'd like to bring up Vera Nichols for a few remarks. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Let's hear it for Canada again. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the warm, warm welcome. Um, I bring you the personal greetings, the warmest greetings from Consul General Nadia Theodore. Um, who couldn't join us this evening, but she's so excited as I am that, that this is happening. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Seth. Finally, I get to see this beautiful place. Uh, thank you to you and your team for making us feel so welcome here. Um, I do have a few remarks to offer, but I just have to tell you on a personal note what an impact this place is already having on me. Um, I grew up, uh, and especially on this evening's programming, because I grew up in uh, northern Manitoba uh, with the polar bears in Churchill and grew up with, uh, side by side with uh, indigenous peoples, peoples of our First Nations and the Inuit. And so it is already having a huge impact on me that we're having this programming here this evening. Um, and then I spent part of my uh, young, adulthood in Saskatchewan, uh, where many um, totem poles would grace uh, areas like Wascana Park in the, in the province's capital city. So it's just, uh, it's already meaningful on several levels. And, and I just happen to love horses and have horses of my own. So imagine the impact on me when I was walking in here. <laughs> it works, it so works for me. Um, so tonight I am very proud to introduce the cultural performance by Gitayas dancers, followed by their keynote lecture on the beauty and meaning 
of Niska's totem poles. I just met with our very special guest uh, who traveled all the way to be here with us tonight from Terrace, British Columbia, Mike D'Angeli and, and, and his wife, Dr. Dr. Mikhail D'Angeli. We Canadians are fiercely proud of our creators and our cultural entrepreneurs, and we're thrilled to see them embraced around the world and here in Georgia this evening. So Mike uh, co-leads the internationally renowned Gitayas Dancers with, as I just mentioned, his wife, Dr. Mikhail D'Angeli. Mike is also, talk about multitasking and multiple talents, is also an accomplished singer, songwriter, and dancer. And one of his specializations is creating masks and other ceremonial wealth that is used in dancing. Mike and Mikhail have performed, held lectures, workshops, and carving demonstrations in, and get this list, Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Indiana, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, British Columbia, Ontario, Yukon, Manitoba, Quebec, Austria, Malaysia, Germany, and Japan. They take pride in respectfully be, being traditionally contemporary and make it a priority to both continue and expand our ancient traditions in contemporary times and as such, sing the songs of ancestors as well as create new songs, dances, drums, rattles, masks, and all the regalia to reflect and record experiences as First Nations people today. Just a few words on behalf of the government of Canada. There is no relationship more important to our government than the one we have with our Indigenous peoples. We share a common desire to build a better future for generations to come. And Canada is committed to moving forward with our Indigenous partners on different paths towards reconciliation, including recognition of rights discussion tables. Uh, we, I'm not standing here saying we have an, a perfect past with our First Nations and Indigenous peoples. We do not, and we are working to set that straight. The Government of Canada works with Indigenous groups at over 75 discussion tables across the country to explore new ways of working together to advance recognition of Indigenous rights and self-determination. Uh, these dis discussions uh, represent more than 380 uh, dis Indigenous communities and a total population of more than 700,000 people. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau recently met with modern treaty and self-governing First Nations for a second time as part of our work together on full self-government, full self-determination about Indigenous lands, full self-determination about how to care for their own people, and full self-determination self in, in terms of the future path of their cultures and traditions. The government has a duty to consult and where appropriate accommodate Indigenous groups when it considers that impacts potential or established ab Aboriginal or treaty rights making genuine and meaningful efforts to avoid or mitigate some of the adverse impacts and hurtful impacts, honestly, that we have seen in the past. So um, I would like to uh, invite Seth back to introduce, I'm sure you don't want to listen to this anymore. You want to see the wonderful performance you're about to experience. And um, again, I'm just so honored to be here on behalf of the consulate. For those of you who may not know us, uh, we're based in Atlanta, but uh, responsible for relations across all six states of the U.S. Southeast, so Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and the Carolinas, and we're very proud uh, to be a part of life in Georgia and meeting, meeting more and more of you uh, at each, through, including through wonderful events like this, so thank you for having us. Vera, thank you very much, and let me, on behalf of the museum, thank you all for uh, making this possible tonight. They covered the costs for our uh, speakers and performers to be here. Also, uh, two years ago, they covered costs for me to travel in Western Canada for three days and to visit some of the great museums in Western Canada and to start thinking up programs like this. And this is the first one that's come about as a result, result of that. Uh, Ash Miller is here somewhere. He's with the consulate. And uh, he was my babysitter for part of that trip and um, made sure I didn't get in any trouble in Vancouver, B.C., and uh, got home okay. But um, 
we were talking with the museum of civilization there in uh, vancouver bc and, and some other places and we talked about maybe having a curator come and do a talk and and uh, the consul and um, and others said well you know why would you do that why wouldn't you have an artist actually come somebody who's actually carved one of these things and somebody who knows more about it intimately at the at the sweat level and so that's what we did and i think that was the right call and I also found out he spent time at the Benning School for Boys here in Georgia, which is where I went to boot camp. So we have that in common. I don't know how he got from there to where he is or b and back, but I hope we're going to find that out. And uh, I'm supposed to read the bio, but Vera read the bio for you, so you get spared hearing it twice. The coolest thing I thought in it, though, was that Mike has built a 30-foot ocean-going canoe. Now, if that doesn't sound scary, I don't know what does. That's even more scary than the Benning School for Boys to me. But, um, but without further ado, uh, I'd like for the Bengalis to take it away. Why some get some get sigidum hanana gobble well tick gobble good at a hot knee and get a wee am up as a gout sabum gua some sort of news some do I you doctor Mike Hill Dangeli do I am gum see why you look ski deep tail go Guess but lots do on that ashlu, no waps, ni so well, do all so white go. What oxed and medir do what white go at a terrace, do what zabu. Look old oyx that knew some. The luam goru now old needs a sum at a look old oyx at noon at a um, booth museum at a Canadian consulate, the warm. In some aliyah, my language, our language of the Simshan, Niska, Gitsan people, I've addressed you as we do in our ceremonies, and I have presented myself as we do by our matrilineal line, as we are matrilineal people. We are everything our mothers and our grandmothers and our great grandmothers are. My real name is Simshlodom Newsom. My other name is Dr. Michael D'Angeli. I have my PhD in Northwest Coast First Nations Art History, and I'm a professor at the University of Northern British Columbia. I'm of the Eagle Clan of the Gispathlots tribe of the House of Nisawalp of the Simshan Nation. I was born and raised in Taquan, Matlakatla, Alaska, our territory is divided by the colonial border that nobody talks about, which is that between British Columbia and Alaska. And my nachs, my husband, Gatsmilch, and I live in Terrace. We'd like to thank all of you for coming here today and for the um, Boston Museum for their invitation, as well as the Canadian Consulate, Oyaxit Newsom. And 
it is our absolute honor to be here in the territories of the Muscogee, Cherokee, and Creek, as well as many other indigenous peoples who have been caretakers of this land since time immemorial. Creek, Cherokee, and a Muscogee. Why some gigat sagam hanach kubo wuxen got some milk? The why you gingola the wuatku? Some milk de badeku? Amasa sagatan? Ama hoople. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As my nox was saying, uh, my traditional name is got some milk, means heart of the beaver house. I'm of the beaver clan of the house of Bait Nech. I am Niska. Simshian, Clinket, and Sitzawit. The, uh, can you guys all see me over here and hear me? Awesome. We uh, are very excited to be here. It's been a, uh, uh, an amazing journey getting out here and being asked uh, by, uh, to represent uh, our people as uh, both Canadian and American. Uh, literally half of my family's home in Portland Canal and Tombstone Bay. Half of our house is in the United States. The other side of the house is in Canada. <laughs> Makes it interesting to go to the washroom. I say jokingly, but uh, it's, it's actually pretty dang true. Um, so we're going we're gonna to change it a little up a little bit here this evening. <clears throat> we're going to share songs and talk as we go through because it's our way and, and even with our translation with speaking Somaliach and then talking in Gamsi Wamach, the uh, English language, uh, it's proper to do that because you guys aren't Somaliach speakers. But we're also because many of you guys have may or may not have seen uh, the work that we do and as far as our ceremonial wealth uh, and sharing our ceremonial beans with all of you here today, we, it's only proper for us to talk about it as we go through. At the end of our performance, we'll have um, a question and answer period. But throughout this whole talk, I'm even gonna be talking about totem poles. As Seth was sharing, uh, I, I make my living as an artist and carver, uh, but I'm also an educator like my Nox, my wife, Dr. D'Angeli. Uh, we teach at a Simshian school, a K through 12 school in Terrace, British Columbia, which also happens to be my dad's community. Uh, it's his traditional villages, but we're matrilineal, meaning everything our mothers are, we are. So many of the songs that we're going to be sharing with you today were songs that were taught to me by my late grandmother, Basach Louise Barton D'Angeli, who, uh, or my mother, who now holds the name Basach, uh, Sigam Hanach Basach, which is a woman chief's name uh, for my mother, Arlene Roberts. This very first song that we shared is a very old and ancient song. The D'Angeli family would sing that when we would travel from the Nass to go visit our relatives in the Stikine River of Southeast Alaska, our Tlingit relatives. And we use this song now to let uh, our relatives wherever we go know that the Get Hayaks and the D'Angeli's are coming. So we do this as a, we sing this song on the bows of our canoes as we travel and uh, they know that we're coming in a good kind way. Because we are guests in this beautiful territory, we are going to dance this next dance. My nachs, my wife and I have been dancing since we were both uh, three and four years old. I think we counted up the years. We have over 70 years of dancing between the two of us combined. Uh, and uh, this next song uh, was taught to me by my late grandparents, Reggie and Louise D'Angeli. I am actually now the sole owner and protector of our family songs. This song as young ones, we're taught to take care of our nach nach. Nach nach means beyond human power, and they are personified through our amilch, our masks, and our amhalite, and other ceremonial beans, our regalia that we wear. We don't call them costumes. Costumes denotes that we're dressing up as something that we are not. This is our finest regalia, our finest clothing that we wear uh, when we go and uh, visit heads of state or visit... Uh, as ambassadors of our people. So we're wearing our traditional regalia to honor our time here, but to also show who our families are in our history. This dance, my Nox is going to dance, and it uh, honors our leaders, our Simgigat and Sigam Hanach. In English, that's our chiefs and our matriarchs. 
It doesn't mean that we, they're like kings and queens. What uh, Chief Samogit means is most relied upon person in the village. So for us, it is uh, a very uh, high title, but it also is a title of responsibility. This is something that I am what's called a mangigat. I am in line to take a chief's name. I am actually the head of my house. Uh, I, am, I am all but uh, a chief without the exception of the title Samoigat. So with my wife, who's a Segem Hanach, a matriarch, uh, she is going to dance what is called our Amhalite, our chief's headdress. In this dance, you're going to see my wife scattering eagle and swans down. Now, we didn't ask for permission. It's better to ask for forgiveness after. This eagle and swans down is a, is a gift from William Ligi Laha, the creator. This is the closest to heaven that we get in this mortal form. Now, if the down lands on you during any time during our performance, and you can see some of it coming up, please take it as a blessing. In English, you would say it's good luck. For us, it is a blessing from our creator. It is a, a blessing from the sky beings. This is, the, as I said, the closest to heaven that we get. We do this, one, to honor all of you here today and our leaders, the Booth Museum, the Canadian Consulate for bringing us here, but we also do this as a sign of peace. We hope that our words, our actions, our songs and dances land as light as the feathers do on all of you here today. Now at the end of our performance and our end of our time here today, if you see any of the down on the ground, please take it as a gift from us for your own medicine bundle. This is something very sacred for us. It sanctifies the floor, it blesses the floor, but this is actually some of our protocol that because we are guests in this beautiful territory, we need to follow our protocol as this is our teachings. My Nachs will now be dancing our Amhalite, our headdress dance. cards if you need all of that um, but that's actually how we get the word out there we love our social media we're 21st century people like all of you and we just love our social media so this is uh, and it's fine to take photos and video so oh, excellent for that and this is our headdress dance why <laughs> So we decided to do our, our program here today uh, in this manner with having the discussion and talking about our songs and dances and then having the question answer period and talking about totem poles and talking about our noch noch because they are all still things that we practice and do to this day. And part of that is our feast and potlatch system. For those of you who don't know, we're very public people. Everything we do as far as our names, our weddings, our funerals, even our divorces, are very, very public. Because it, what it does is it shows our responsibility to our community, but it also makes us accountable to our village, to our people, to our houses, to our families. And so the, the feast potlatch system is something that is still practiced to this day. I've hosted 20 potlatches, which is quite a bit. My wife's hosted 19. 
and that's a lot for young people, youngish people. Um, but this is something that is still in practice to this day. And we actually use potlatches for our totem poles as well. And all of what you're seeing here today, the totem poles, our regalia that are wearing, and our masks, I've carved all of what you're seeing here today. I make my living as an artist and carver, but I'm also an educator, and we'll get into that throughout this whole process of us talking. But as I was saying, um, the reason we decided to do this is that uh, my wife and I just came in from the West Coast this morning on the Red Eye. And so we got just a few hours sleep. We're excited to be here, and we actually leave first thing in the morning uh, to, to go back to uh, our school in, in Terrace, British Columbia. But uh, we wanted to do this to kind of make it a little, a little bit more, f uh, this formality a little bit more informal, but sharing who we are to give you a broader understanding of why uh, the totem poles, why our masks and ceremonial beans are so important to us. This next dance, because my wife and I have spent so much time, I actually spent 20 years in Vancouver, and I had a studio at the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Center for over 20 years, and uh, that's actually where we started this dance group, the Get High X Dancers. We have over 40 members, and uh, we've traveled all, extensively all over the world, uh, just from what the introductions were shared here earlier, but uh, we also have made some really beautiful connections with many different nations, in particular uh, because of Vancouver being on unceded Coast Salish territory. Now, unceded means it has never been surrendered through war and has never gone through treaty. And so uh, basically the entire population of Vancouver is squatting on Salish territory, uh, if we were to look at it from a legal standpoint. This uh, song we received in trade through one of our dear Squamish relatives, Sa'aplak, Bob Baker. And he leads a beautiful dance group called Spokwa Salam, the Eagle Song Dancers. This being that we're going to be sharing with you, they call Anaha'in. In our language, we call this being Satampti. In English, it is the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird's job is to get everybody's attention to hold a position amongst our feast hall, inside our big houses, inside our long houses, as one of the most important position, exactly what you guys are doing here this evening, being witnesses. For us, when we host a feast or a potlatch, the witnesses are the most in, uh, one of the most important pe uh, beings in that feast potlatch system as much as it is for the reasons we're holding our feasts and potlatches. Anacha in satampti, gets everybody's attention. We are asked to be witnesses. We are asked to listen, to watch, to feel in our hearts, then eventually go share what we witnessed here today. Today we have it a lot easier. We can go Facebook Live. We can post on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, it's a beautiful way of being a witness, but this is a way for us that we've been doing since time immemorial. You're going to see my, dance, my wife dancing all the beautiful colors at the Thunderbird, uh, of this beautiful Thunderbird. Now for us, we have sacred and ceremonial colors, but we also have every color in the rainbow that Samagadalaha has gifted us. And we have names for every one of those colors. So we argue that that makes them just as traditional as our ceremonial colors. This is Anaha in Satampti, the Thunderbird. So go them guts, man!
So this next song was composed, I commissioned a good friend of ours by the name of Christine Martin to compose this next song to commemorate my first totem pole raising in Vancouver, BC. <clears throat> the poll that uh, I did was a poll that was actually started uh, as a student project. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the artist um, flaked out, unfortunately. And so uh, they asked me to come in on the project and that totem pole was in a very different place. Uh, it had been stolen twice and, and uh, ended up over on Vancouver Island from Vancouver. But to change the energy of that totem pole, um, I sat with, with my elders and, and particularly with my mother and my grandmother and talked to them about this pole. Because it actually came in a very important my, time in my life. Uh, I, as uh, Seth was saying, I served 10 years as a US Army Airborne Ranger. Actually, I have four tours. Uh, I joined the Army at 17. Um, and my mom had to sign, sign me off to go and do that. And I spent some very formative years here in, in your beautiful state. Uh, not, not in one of the best places on earth, I could say. <laughs> but it sure beat some of the other places. But it was, a, it was important for me to be a part of that as I am actually fifth generation to serve in the military. And I'll share it with that even more as we go out through this whole process. Um, but this totem pole, and I came home and I, uh, I had some, uh, as I said, I served four tours. And uh, I came home with, with some baggage. And so the, and uh, had, had been recently divorced and gone through some really ugly things. And so that totem pole was a physical manifestation of where I was at in that moment in time. And so for me to change that energy within that pole and to change that energy within my own life, uh, I embraced our, my people's culture and my people's art. Uh, and it's, it's what, uh, why I'm here today. It's what saved me. This totem pole was a very special being in my life. Um, I have since carved 25 totem poles. I'm actually starting my 26th uh, here in the, in the, hopefully in the late spring, early summer uh, for the murdered and missing women uh, and uh, uh, residential school survivors in Northern BC. I'm, I'm hoping that that project goes through, but it's really important, our totem poles do many, many things. They're not just artwork. They talk about our history. They talk about our people. They talk about uh, former chiefs. They talk, as, the, as the, his successor uh, comes forward, these totem poles are our written form of history. They're made out of old growth western red cedar. And so when you first get them, they have that beautiful, rich aromatic that we all recognize as cedar. And they have that beautiful reddish brown color. And as they age, they become that silver gray color like you see on the totem pole that's out here. Another thing that I would wish to share with you is all of the beans on there are important. Now, a, a misnomer in Western culture is to say, oh, the low man on the totem pole. Well, actually, the, lowest, the, the figure closest to the ground is actually the most important figure as it carries the weight of the entire totem pole. So it needs to be a strong bean. I'm really grateful to see the totem pole out here is actually of the Lachtzimuth, the beaver clan, which is my clan. This totem pole has a connection that you guys have here, a connection to my family. Eli Gosnell and Jane Gosnell, Jane Gosnell were brother and sister. Jane Gosnell was my great-great-grandmother. So this is a very close connection within my family and it means a lot to be able to come out here. And the fact that they have so many of my other family's crests on there, but that they actually have human beings on there and salmon, which is an important being species amongst our people. And the totem pole is uh, a beautiful way of being able to share just a small portion of who we are. As we talk throughout this process, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more depth. And if you guys have questions, I'm, I'm so, uh, at the end, I, I can uh, answer any of those questions. So this totem pole that I carved, my first totem pole in Vancouver with this next song, honors both my, uh, my wife's crest, the eagle, and it's one of my crests, the bear. So that little, uh, that little eight foot totem pole that I did for the city of Vancouver uh, was a great uh, experience for me in, in my own personal growth. I actually had 500 kids from the Vancouver school area come and help assist and be a part and lay their hands on that totem pole. And I had 12 assistants. 
Now, it sounds like a lot for a very small poll, which it is, but what I ended up doing is teaching those 12 people to host and raise a totem pole at Tz'an and our traditional method of feasting and potlatching and gifting people for witnessing that, that event. So without any further ado, this is our eagle song. Shagunam <laughs> Gatsmana! System. Thank you so much. So within our, um, as, as it was shared, I'm, uh, I'm a composer of our traditional songs. My wife is an uh, amazing Somaliac speaker. Somaliac is the language spoken amongst the Nishka, Simshian, and Giksan. She actually teaches it at the K through 12 uh, at the Na'aksagilakil, the school that we both work at, the Simshian school. But she also teaches at a uh, university in Northern British Columbia. She actually has three adult classes uh, going on right now, and, and it's, uh, it's beautiful to hear that. I'm actually learning the language as well. And so for me, it's being able to uh, work on that to be able to compose new songs and to write new songs. Many of the songs that we have, some of them are very old and ancient. Some of them are new. For us to commission somebody to write a song, just like I heard uh, with the Garth Brooks songwriter, it's a huge thing for us. It shows our wealth, but it also show, shares the trust that you have and that uh, artist's ability to tell your history. So for, us to com for me to commission somebody to write uh, that song, that eagle song, to com uh, commemorate my first totem pole raising was a huge thing and a very old thing for us to do. This next song was composed by uh, my wek in Lannan, David Nelson III. David and I grew up together in Metlakatla, Alaska. Uh, we were, were lifelong friends. He's an amazing song composer as well, and he gifted us this song. This dance, and my wife, as you can see, is an amazing dancer. She's actually a choreographer. We, uh, she gets commissioned up and down the coast to choreograph new mask dances where I make the masks or compose the song. So this is something that we still continue to do to this day and, have, and actually are getting ready for several uh, potlatches for in uh, the Yukon in Alaska where we're asked to do this work. This song that we're sharing next happens to honor one of my favorite heroes. His name is Tamsum. Tamsum is human personified. Tamesim is a transformer, a shapeshifter, a trickster. His favorite form on the West Coast is that of the raven. To our relatives in the Plains Plateau and over the mountains and all the way out here, he sometimes goes by mink or coyote. He is a really big trickster, but he loves teaching us. And he's, sometimes he's kind, sometimes he's a glutton. But the wonderful thing about raven is for no matter how the story goes or what he does for his, uh, satisfying his own well-being. As I said, he's human personified. He's looking out for number one. For whatever reason, the creator always teases him so that he helps us as human beings. So you're going to be seeing the ravens. And at, at this time, uh, ravens in the beginning of time were actually white. 
And because of them, re, uh, the raven releasing, helping release the sun and the moon and the stars from a chief in the Nass Valley, raven's uh, feathers became stained and darkened uh, because of the, the sun and the ash that burnt part of his feathers and it turned it black. This is why ravens are black now. And so you're going to be seeing my wife dancing the supernatural Tamsin, the white raven. So you've been warned that sometimes Tamsin loves to tease us. And I ask that you be gentle with each other and, and be good sports, okay? So this is our raven dance. <laughs> So I told you, Tamsom loves to tease us. And so um, part of that is that that teasing is in and through a lot of what's happened to our people, the, the potlatch ban. I was really grateful to hear um, that talked about, that um, everybody thinks, you know, there's um, the grass is always greener on the other side. And within, uh, with, with the consulate talking about that it hasn't been perfect. At one time, everything that you're being seen here and even our language being spoken was outlawed and against the law. So what we've had to do is, is the years are 1884 to 1951. So for us, using humor to, to get over some of those things, to talk about those things is really important for us, and particularly with this being. So these two people who lost something for us, when something from the supernatural world comes and taps us on the mortal realm, that is a huge blessing. So I say antoixism to both you guys for being such good sports. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <clears throat> so for, for this next song is one of my own personal powers. As I said, noch noch means beyond human power and it's personified through our milk, through our masks, through our songs and it's brought to life and shared at feasts and potlatches, it's shared at cultural sharings. It's used to educate those around us. This song comes from a very important moral story that my grandparents and mother shared with me as a young boy is a moral story about what we put out into the world is exactly what we get back. So if we're mean and nasty, that's what we're going to get. But if we do things out of kindness, love, and compassion, that's what we're going to get back, hopefully. 
But even when we're faced against ugliness, we still need to uh, be loving and compassionate and kind. This story was taught to me by my uh, late grandparents, Reggie and Louise D'Angeli. And in this story, it's, it's about the beaver and the porcupine, about how they treat each other nasty and how it comes back to bite them. And particularly one part of this story, one of our uh, little beings calls upon the strongest of the four winds, the north wind. The north wind, we're taught as young ones all the way through our lives, is a messenger. It carries, the north wind carries our prayers to the creator, and the creator uses us being to carry strength back to us. Now, I saw this twice in my own life. The first time was in 1991 when my Uncle Bill passed away, my mother's brother. My Uncle Bill was my absolute hero. He was a Marine in Vietnam. He played for the University of Washington Huskies in two Rose Bowls. I actually got to sit on the bench with all the players, with my uncle and, and at the Rose Bowl game. It was, it was a, a real highlight in my life. But my uncle also taught me to read Leo the Lion. And I was very, very young. And when he passed in 1991, it left a very large hole in my heart and my family's heart. As we were burning food and clothing for his journey to the other side, because death is a way of looking at transition for us. We treat a, a passing like a feast or a potlatch. We burn food, we burn clothing so that our relative, our ancestor can go and feast and potlatch with the ancestors in the real world on the other side. And so we're burning food and clothing and my family af asked to share songs. So we were singing and dancing and, and praying for the safe journey of my uncle. My family asked that I share a song. So I began thinking about what songs I wanted to share and I wanted to ask for strength for me and my family. As I said, my uncle was a very important person in my life. As I began singing on the beach, the wind and the water and the waves began to get louder and stronger, the louder and stronger that I sang this song. And when I stopped, they too stopped. Coincidence maybe, but we don't have coincidences. The following year, my other uncle, Don, and my dad, Pat, my father, passed away in a boating accident. As we were with our Clinkett relatives in Saxman, Alaska, preparing for their journey, again, I was offered, asked to sing a song, so I began singing to the north wind. The louder I sang, the stronger I sang, the stronger the wind and the waves became. And when I stopped, it too stopped. It was then that my family, my mother and my grandmother and my, and, uh, my grandfather said that I needed to take this as a noch noch, as a power song, as a prayer song, to bring strength to those in need. This is one of the songs that I sang, as well as many of my other songs, to get me through my combat experience. Combat experiences. When my wife and I started this dance group, this is one of the first songs that we asked to write our his, ourselves into this ongoing history of this song. This is such an old song. We've lost count of how many generations the D'Angelis have been singing it. We've lost count of who composed it. It's just always been part of our wealth. It's so old, it actually has connections to my wife's family as her grandma sang, her late grandmother sang it as she was a little girl as well. But it didn't have a mask and it didn't have a dance to go with it. So we sat down and carved the masks and my wife choreographed this dance. It's a wonderful marriage of the old and the new, honoring our rich, complex history, but also honoring the richness and complexities of who we are as 21st century indigenous people. This is our Northwind song. Lege ga gulge ga gulge ga gulge Lege ga gulge ga gulge ga gulge Ho ho Zabales, oh, hey. Let it go. 
Our last song that we'll be sharing with you, and then we'll open up the floor to any questions that you have. It's a very old and ancient song. This song was survived through my late grandfather, Samagic Oye, Chief Reggie Dangeli. This song comes from our Tsitsawit side. The Tsitsawits are the Dene speaking Southern Athabascans of Southeast Alaska. According to anthropologists and archaeologists, they're supposed to be extinct. Yet, I stand in front of you today as a descendant of the Tsitsawit, which in itself is a huge victory. Our ancestors would sing this song when they returned home from combat, and they would laugh and taunt our enemies because we had survived. In recent history, as I said, my grandfather, uh, I, have a, I come from a long line of veterans. My great-grandfather actually served in the Alaska Territorial Guard, uh, my grandfather was a veteran of World War II. He was in the Philippine campaign. He actually stayed behind when MacArthur left, you know, in his big speech, I shall return. My grandfather actually stayed and fought uh, against the Japanese insurgents with the Filipino people doing guerrilla warfare. When he returned home, our family sang this song. My Uncle Bill, who I spoke of earlier, was a Marine in Vietnam. He was actually... Uh, uh, his second tour, he was uh, uh, detached as an embassy guard and was there at the fall of Saigon in 1975. When he returned home, our family sang that song, this song. My two brother cousins, Frank Watson was in, U in the Navy. My brother cousin, Ron D'Angeli, was in the Marines. And as I said, I served 10 years as an Army Ranger. When we returned home from our tours of duty and combat, our family sang this song. Not only do we continue to sing this song for our warriors and our veterans, but we sing it for our residential school survivors. We sing this song for our young ones when they graduate from elementary school to middle school to high school to college and university. Our youngest son, Tim Kjolt Hayek's Nick D'Angeli and I hosted a potlatch for my wife when she became the very first Aboriginal to get a doctorate in the study of art history. So we hosted a potlatch for her and we sang that song for that time. We sing this song every opportunity we can because we are still the, the policies against us as indigenous people, uh, outlawing our language, our culture, our ways of knowing and being did not work. We're still practicing our language, our culture, our songs and our dances. We use this as an opportunity to take back our power all the time. This next little journey, uh, as I shared with you before, I am, uh, my family's home, half of it is in Canada, and the other side of the ho uh, house is in the United States, and I served 10 years as an Army Ranger. Our people are on both sides of the border. My wife is actually going to talk about, the, uh, about this next, why we're claiming victory over this, and it's actually very important, as I know the consulate is here, and I'm really grateful to hear that they are working towards 
reconciliation, and this actually has something to do with it as well. There's a difference between being indigenous to what is now Canada and being born in Canada. Not all people who are indigenous to Canada are born in Canada. And I'm one of those people, so is my Nax. And through the Jay Treaty, which is a treaty that was signed between the British and the US, if you're indigenous to Canada and you're a status Indian, you can essentially live like our ancestors did, borderless. You can apply to the US for your SIN, your social security number, and live here as a US citizen. They, of course, because this is the way the colonial government is on this side, is obsessed with blood quantum. So they have to quantify you as 50% for you to qualify to live as a US citizen under the Jay Treaty when you are a citizen of Canada, but you're a status Indian. Canada has not reciprocated that treaty. They've never codified it. And it's created what I refer to as Canada's indigenous border wall. So my husband and I, we're actually in an immigration battle with Canada right now. I was supposed to be deported from Canada on Canada Day just this last summer. If you Google my name, you'll see it in the CBC. You'll see it in Huffington News. Um, it was the Canada Day full page spread for many newspapers across the country with all of the policies, as I'm sure you're familiar with in the US against immigration. The US actually does more to recognize indigenous rights than Canada does. Without that reciprocation, we are being kept out of living in our own territory. So even with a Canadian PhD and a Canadian master's and English unfortunately being my first language, as a result of 150 years of abuse of our people through the residential school sy system and other forms of missionization. I rank the highest on the application because of my education and my specialization. But my husband, who is a status Indian, who is Niska, his is one of the modern day treaties, his nation is one of the modern day treaties. They were supposed to relinquish their status card to become treaty after the 2000 final agreement was signed. And nobody, there's not one border agent we've ever come across that recognizes what has replaced status cards for Niska people, which are Niska citizenship cards. And so when he is supposed to have all the rights of a Canadian citizen through, and this is what has been argued through the Niska Treaty, uh, when we got married in 2011, he wasn't allowed to sponsor me in the country. He was told that he was not a Canadian citizen. He's lived and worked in Canada with a non-expiring SIN number for the majority of his life. And so I thought, at the time I was in my PhD program, so I thought, okay, I'll just let me finish my PhD and then we'll worry about it. And then I got a postgraduate work um, visa after I graduated from UBC in 2015 and that's what expired uh, Canada Day last year. Two of my applications for work visa were, was uh, denied by Canadian immigration. The first time it was denied um, because they don't actually tell you. So I went to MP Nathan Cullen's office and his assistant got a hold of immigration and they said that my application was denied based on the fact that I hadn't taken the required English exam. <laughs> I've done both my PhD and my MA in Canada, both written in English. We are in British Columbia, conquered by the British, right? So we speak English on that side of Canada for the most part. And so I killed the messenger when she told me um, because I'm teaching some Aliyah and our language, the Simshan language, is critically endangered. We have five fluent first language speakers left in Alaska. We have 56 now, because we've lost two recently, um, in British Columbia. We've lost 
over half of our fluent first language mother tongue speakers in the past four years. So I left a tenure track position at the University of Alaska Southeast East, where I was assistant professor of Alaska Native Studies to come and work with our fluent speakers and to help start the first immersion school in our nation's history. And Canada, every time I go to try to try to adhere to the system, denies me. There's nowhere on this application that you can identify by your race. And I know that that's Canada's way of protecting itself from discrimination. But when it comes to people who are US born, indigenous to Canada, this is another form of erasure. This is another form of marginalization. This is another form of disenfranchisement, displacement, diaspora, all the other ways in which the colonial government has removed us and our rights in order to eradicate us, its termination. So when I'm with my 80 students, K through 12, when I'm working with my elders, and there was a time where I didn't think I was gonna be able to come back, we were all beyond heartbroken. Um, I ended up having to get an immigration lawyer, and I got a BCPMP, a provincial nomination process, which is for skilled trade workers. Um, barely qualified for that, and was able to get um, a visa, which I now expire in 2000. My immigration lawyer is very um, empathetic and knows that this is wrong. Um, the hardest thing that she had to tell me as we're going through this process that when, when and if I become a permanent resident, the next step is that I sponsor Mike into the country. We don't fit into this box. There's nothing that, there's no, there's nothing about immigration law in Canada that communicates with the Indian Act, that communicates with the Jay Treaty. They're all manipulating lives. They're two hands manipulating all these lives, not knowing what the next hand is doing. And so, as much as we, our work is desperately needed, and as much as we're called upon, you're not the, it's not the first time the Canadian consulate has called upon us. We're, in Japan, we were called uh, Mr. and Mrs. Canada <laughs> the entire time we were there because we were representing Canada and we do so proudly. Yet Canada rejects us. And so we're talking about this in relation to our victory song because we have to, we have to claim victory over it. It's a war of attrition. And um, I don't know how much longer we can take it, but we're going to try as long as we can. With Canada's commitment to the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 96 calls to action, 94 calls to action, excuse me, and also the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, both of which protect the rights um, for the, the right to practice your culture and to speak your language, the right to be in your territory. Um, within the UN Declaration of on the Rights of Indigenous People in particular, it, talks about self-determination as not infringing upon um, the rights of citizenship, that it shouldn't, it shouldn't hinder the process of citizenship. And in every way that we have been uh, confronted in this process, even told by Canadian immigration that I should list him as a landed immigrant on my application, which there were solutions never make any sense and it wasn't, it was rejected anyhow. Um, all of it, all of the ways that we self-determine, that, that our people, it's not self-determination is an ind individualistic. It's about the collective nature of our ancient and ancestral ways. In all the ways that our self-determination has defined our identities, <coughs> it has gotten in the way of our citizenship in Canada. So, talking to all of you, because we do have a petition, 
and we're going to continue. We've, we're, I'm supposed to meet, hopefully, with uh, um, Minister of Reconciliation, uh, Scott Fraser, and others about this. Um, because I'm not the only one. Mike and I are not the only one. When you can use the Jade Treaty to move here, which is very exciting, especially for young people that want to go to university in the States, what you don't know until it happens to you is if you fall in love and have a child, you can't come back to Canada because your child has no rights there. They're a U.S. citizen. So we get phone calls, Facebook messages, emails all the time about these horrific situations where Canada's lack of the reciprocation of the J Treaty is continuing to strengthen and build higher and more impenetrable Canada's indigenous border wall, separating families, communities, siblings. So we are doing what we can and all the ways of our ancestors as well as all of the ways that we've learned to adopt by the current times that we live in. And this victory song is a part of that. As we were talking about, you're probably wondering why. Well, all of this is, is going into what we said in the very beginning about talking about compassion, about kindness about moving forward as good human beings. So for us, this is a way of claiming victory, for educating not just about who we are, not just about totem poles, not just about our art, not just about our dancing and our songs, but about our ways of knowing and being as we've shared so much with you here this evening. And we're gonna be, uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you have after. But we hope that Samagat Laha continues to shine in your lives. Part of our belief system is that we're born as bright, shining beings. And as we go through life, that light becomes dulled. It becomes jaded, it faded. And it's our job to find that light again, to shine that light so that others can follow that same path and make a road, to make a highway. And so we hope that our lights shine so that you can find your path, or if you have your light, that we can see it as well, to create a movement of kindness and understanding. We sing a victory song for that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We've got time for just a couple of questions if anybody's got one. Yeah. That's actually the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> So our, our totem poles, and totem poles are usually only found on the west coast because of the old growth western red cedar. Uh, and unfortunately those are going to the way of the dodo bird uh, just because of deforestation. You need an, an, an old growth is anywhere from 500 years or older. Uh, they're, they're free of knots and what have you. We actually lay them flat. We carve them three quarters uh, of the tree 
we flatten off the back and actually hollow it out. Because where we live, we still have really harsh winters. And the rain and the uh, snow and the weather and the hot sun causes it, just like our skin, to check and crack. You know how you get when you're out in the, in the harsh weather for too long, you get chapped lips and what have you. So the same thing with the totem poles. So we hollow them out so that it gives a little bit of flex. And we carve them on the ground. And once it's up, we don't touch it anymore. Mike, uh, you mentioned the pot latch, and that's part of standing up a totem pole. Could you just quickly describe that part of it? Yeah, with the, with the totem pole raising, and my wife has actually uh, been the one to, because we get our opposites to do it for us, and I went the extreme opposite of creating balance of power, by, and that's something that my wife and I both do in our personal lives, but also in our, in, in our traditions of bo having both masculine and feminine power. So I've asked my wife to be the one that's in charge of all of my pole raisings, and she guides people and tells she's the boss. She's able to tell them. So one of the reasons that we don't have carvers raise their own totem poles is because they're so mo emotionally um, invested. And depending on the size of the totem pole, the biggest totem pole raising that I've ever been in charge of was a 40-foot totem pole in my community. It's a veteran's totem pole that honors all of our all of our veterans um, with us and those that have gone on and um, when you're a part of the carving of that pole even when I'm, that's how Mike and I met I'm a carver as well and we we're both apprentices under mm -hmm. um, the same master carver when you're preparing in that ceremony the carver really steps back and it's a time for them to to be most present and to take the, the essentially the worry and the burden off of their shoulders and in in our communities we still do it by hand there's no um you know cranes like many museums now because of liability and insurance they'll they'll use a crane to put a total pole in place but um, ours is done through a system of um, ropes and um, pieces of wood that or come together like this underneath, like this, this was the pole, underneath the pole right there to hold the weight at different different times. Um, and literally the whole community pulls together to pull to pull the totem pole totally up. And um, that is a balance um, between the, the strengths on all of the ropes, because you can see uh, um, if the pole is going in this direction or going in the other direction, which, which side needs to hold back and what side needs to pull harder so that it, it raises at center. And um, so it, it can be um, in Mike's village uh, in Gingola, they're known to have raised historically one of the tallest totem poles. It was 100 feet. It took three days to do it. Yeah. And a 40-foot totem pole takes about um, it depends on how far we carry it, because we also carry it to the place it's being raised. Um, so uh, men and women will carry the wood across their arms like this, that's underneath um, the pole. And the entire time you have someone relieve you. So you have uh, a line of two people on the outside um, of each piece of wood and then two more people who are constantly relieving them. It's a lot, it's a whole community-wide effort um, to raise the totem pole. And then everyone who helped raise the totem pole is gifted. All of the witnesses are gifted. For us, it's not about um, the wealthiest person isn't the person that accumulates the most. It's about the person that is able to distribute the most. And essentially, it's the opposite of capitalism. It's about the distribution of wealth. And that, that for us is real wealth, is about making sure that everybody is taken care of. And that's a part of our ceremonies. I really, this yeah, lady. The gal in the center. Right underneath the camera. You had a question? I think just what I yeah, just what, she just, was just what I shared about the gifting, about the redistribution of wealth. Um, Levi Strauss did a whole study on that because it was uh, it was also one of the reasons why the government, um, you know, their 
reasons that they put forward to um, ban it. They thought it was the frivolous giveaway um, that was keeping us impoverished, not realizing that it was a total different economic system and that um, poverty amongst our people actually increased a thousandfold after the potlatch system um, had to go underground. It didn't stop completely when it was criminalized in, in 1884, and especially our elderly, because our elderly, they were taken care of in such a dynamic way um, that they didn't have to worry about having food throughout the year because they ha were given the food that they needed. Um, and with that, when that system changed, that's when, that's when everything changed for our people. So with the burning, that was what I was sharing with the North Wind song. It's so that they get, our ancestors who are on the other side uh, can actually feast in potlatch on that side as well. Are there any other questions? I have one. Oh, hold on. This, he hasn't this asked the question. Yeah. Um, you know, the um, protocol is carbon ground. Yeah. And then you raise it. Yes, sir. So is there, is it, you know, to make sure it's secure, the foundation for it, do you do anything or is it just kind of buried in the ground? Or uh, we do cement foundations now. But traditionally, because uh, they, they last longer, they do last longer. And, and before in the past, they would actually, uh, depending on how, how tall the pole was, half of it would be in the ground, buried into the ground. So be, there would be at least probably four feet because our, um, our weather is so humid that uh, rot sets in really quick. Um, we live in a tempered rainforest as, as our area. Well, they, they, well um, our are we do we have incredibly high winds but for us the raising of the totem pole is is a, it's like the declaration of the statement of the peoples whose whose lineage is being validated through the crests that are on the pole and it's uh the aging process is really important to us it's uh, again opposite of western ways where conservationists come in and they do everything that they can. I'm sure that t the totem pole outside has been worked on so many times, especially because of how hot the summers are here. For us, it's supposed to age. It's a sign of how long that that declaration, that statement has been made. It would be like taking an archival document and retyping it and throwing the archival document away. I've, I've worked in museums all over the world, including the National Museum of the American Indian, so I have all these museum analogies. <laughs> But that's essentially what, you, what you're doing in the process of conservation. For us, if the totem pole falls, that means that the successor of the, the name or the, the leaves of the house, it's up to them to, to re-raise re it, um, to raise a new one. So we're constantly um, creating new. It, and if we didn't, it would be as though um, only what happened in the past is relevant. Like the history, and it would be as though all the history books, there's no more history books that are going to be written because everything's been taken care of already, which you, all of us know that's never true. <laughs> history is written in different perspectives all the time, and that's what totem poles are. They are, my husband said, it's a, it's a, our written language, and if you didn't know, we didn't have a written language prior to linguists coming and trying to put together orthographies to communicate the sounds of our language. And so our, our orthography is only as old as, it's only two years older than me. It was 1978 that it was somewhat finalized. Got time for one more. So uh, my dissertation, um, yeah. I'm just going to move it over. My voice is going out a little bit. Um, my dissertation is specifically on the dances of um, our Northwest Coast Indigenous people. It's called Dancing Sovereignty, Politics and Protocol in Northwest Coast First Nations Dance. Um, so if you, if you look up my name on any on Circle, many of you know Circle. I, see another, I met another <laughs> academic in the room earlier. Um, my full dissertation is there and talks about the process of creating new songs and dances. So over the time period that our, our culture was criminalized in Canada from 1884 to 1951, what survived was the songs. 
and um, songs in terms of the transfer of knowledge. Uh, songs took on all these different lives. Um, one song, and I'll have my next demonstrate, um, within his family is this beautiful entry song where you're um, expressing how happy and excited you are to be in, in this place that you're at, at this ceremony. And it became a funeral dirge. A lot of songs <coughs> survived under the guise of Christianity um, as missionaries saw fit. Dances, as you know, bodily practices, you can't, those are much harder to conceal. Um, and a beautiful uh, experience that my, my husband had. Did you want to demonstrate the song first? Uh, is how we normally sing it. And then as the funeral dirge, life is just sucked out of it, right? And that's the state of our culture at the time, but how do you survive a cultural oppression? Everything that you've been told about who you are is not only beaten out of you, sex, tons of sexual abuse at residential school, P you know, young people died, um, many of thousands of young people died in residential school. Your life uh, and the life of your family really depended on your uh, ability to either stop practicing or practicing the culture in a way that um, was under, could, could be seen as a part of Christian practices so that you weren't sent to jail, so that your family's wealth wasn't confiscated and put in with museum collections. So his grandfather, um, I really feel, has car carried forward a practice of um, communicating dance when you can't you can't show somebody how a dance is done with your entire body. Um, and it was partially due to his rheumatoid arthritis, but I really see it as a continuation. That's why so many dances have continued in his family. You do want to tell so me? So when we're, that first dance that, we, that Mike Yell and I shared was our Amphalite, our headdress dance. And so my grandfather, teaching me how to dance this and moving our heads around, we just used his hand and how we we go in the different directions, but he did that in a way, and that was the what how, he took you to and, the he, and he took me to down to the beach to look at the whirlpool. And for us, that is a very sacred place. The whirlpool is where we seek our visions, but it's also the, the eagle down and the swans down is actually you, when you move your head around enough, and I've only been able to do it once in my life, I was about 17, you're able to move your head and get that whirlpool, the eagle down and swans down, and we call throwing power. You're able to throw that down onto somebody and actually send it to somebody. And that's actually a very old belief within our dances. And my grandfather taught me to do that. His grandfather had rheumatoid arthritis, so he couldn't move his neck at, at all. So he showed him with his hand. And um, so it's so our songs and dances change. Um, and they, uh, but they're always deeply, deeply rooted. Uh, I wouldn't be able to create new, new dances if I hadn't started dancing when I was, you know, just able to walk, essentially. And same with Mike, that it doesn't come out of, uh, it comes out of a long-standing practice like any art form. How about so one more round of applause for our guests, thank please? Thank you. All right, system. What were you going to say? That's it. So I know we went over, and Oyaxit Newsom, thank you guys for such a wonderful day and for us to be able to share just a small portion of who we are. To our wonderful host and Oyaxit Newsom, thank you guys to the consulate, to the Booth Museum, to all of you for making it such a wonderful evening. And please come down and get a blessing off the floor. Yes, please do. And if you have questions, we'll, we'll stick around for a few more minutes so you guys, if you have any other further questions.